I believe that people should have the choice to be members of a union. Michael Gove has a slightly showier past than most politicians. You come out without protection. As a younger man, he tried his hand at comedy. He's neither a spectator columnist nor a sociologist. He's an armed robber. <laughs> Some of Michael Gove's university friends have told me that they didn't expect him to become a politician at all. They thought he'd be a sort of Scottish Stephen Fry. He has an instinct to provoke and to entertain that served him well as a columnist. In fact, his officials and advisers still say his desire to be interesting above all sometimes gets him into scrapes. Or just total weirdness. My favourite character in Game of Thrones is undoubtedly Tyrion Lannister. Hey everybody, take a look at me. I've got street credibility. I may not have a job, but I have a good time with the boys I meet down on the line. But Michael Gove is deadly serious. As Education Secretary, he drove massive reforms, becoming a bete noire both of teachers and their unions. Michael Gove, the demented Dalek of speed. <laughs> After a brief spell as Chief Whip, he's used his tenure as Justice Secretary to try to shake up prisons too. Michael is a committed social reformer, committed to the issues of aspiration, social justice. Those are things I care about. I want to see that the next leader of the Conservative Party and Prime Minister. But would you say he's a details man? Well, Michael, I have to say, is all over details. And I, and I look at him and the way he conducts himself in Cabinet and with the prison reforms and, uh, and everything else. But he's also got big shoes to fill and important negotiations happen with the EU. And I think he's the right person for that task. One area where Mr Gove has some very distinctive views is the Northern Irish peace process. Back in 2000, he wrote a pamphlet for the CPS in which he argued that the approach to Republican terrorists reminded him of appeasement in the 1930s. Back in 2006, he wrote a book, Celsius 77, in which he argued that Islamist terrorists had taken sucker and been encouraged by the way that Britain had dealt with Northern Ireland. Looking at this pamphlet he wrote in 2000, it's pretty far out. It's further out than the DUP. He accuses the Good Friday Agreement of being appeasement and suggests that we should rip it up and go back to fighting the IRA. That's a pretty wild thought. And is Northern Ireland likely to be an issue in the coming years? Well, I've just been in Northern Ireland and I have to say it's a bit tense at the moment. The outcome of the referendum, uh, where of course Northern Ireland voted to remain in the European Union, means that people are a bit on edge. Cabinet colleagues of Mr Gove say he's still a hardliner on this issue, as he is on Islamist extremism. He's also a neoconservative, so in favour of the Iraq war that, back in 2004, he attacks the Daily Mail's coolness on it. In foreign affairs, as in so many other areas of life, if we were to follow the Daily Mail's advice, then we really would be heading for disaster. And you don't need to be Nostradamus to see why. No, we don't have a paper, but but this know. week, a leaked email from Sarah Vine, Mr Gove's wife, revealed she thought they could win over Paul Dacre, editor of the Daily Mail. Wrongly, it's emerged this evening. He's gone for Theresa May. The leaked email, though, also suggests they could get the support of Rupert Murdoch, Official records show Mr Gove, a former employee of Mr Murdoch's at the Times, has maintained close contact with the Murdoch's and their executives, meeting them time and time again. The Goves are also guests at Mr Murdoch's most recent wedding, and Mr Murdoch suggested Mr Gove should run only this week. Now, it's often observed, and it's absolutely true, that Michael Gove is exceptionally personally courteous. But there's a wrinkle. It's very striking that people who cause Mr Gove personal difficulty often face quite bizarrely vitriolic press coverage shortly afterwards. And that applies whether you're a cabinet minister like Caroline Spellman or Philip Hammond or a journalist like me. Back in 2011, I was the education reporter at the Financial Times and I reported that Michael Gove had been using his wife's personal email accounts for government business. This kept public information out of the hands of his own officials, whom he didn't trust, and away from freedom of information requesters. In reply, I got a wave of quite nasty personal press comment by friends of Michael Gove. An anonymous Twitter account repeatedly abused me, and attempts were made to get the company that owns the Financial Times to fire me. Mr Gove has less polite people on hand. For example, Dominic Cummings, his most aggressive aide and a former bigwig in Vote Leave. Two men united by radicalism, if not temperament. 
I would characterise Michael Gove as being essentially a radical, a conservative radical. Uh, it's easy to think of him as very much in the same stable as David Cameron. Uh, they came in as part of this sort of compassionate, modernising force in the Conservative Party. But I think what I've learnt working with and seeing Michael's activities and views over a sustained period of time is actually he and the Prime Minister are very different individuals. The Prime Minister, a small C Conservative, Michael Gove, a capital R Radical. Say what you like, but life under Michael Gove's Premiership certainly wouldn't be dull. <laughs>